people often think of CBT as uh, disputing, and they think of it as, you know, you have certain thoughts and beliefs and you've got to challenge, challenge the beliefs. And cognitive restructuring is one part of CBT, but it's only a, a, a small part of a whole group of techniques. So um, in a short time, I'm going to try and sort of move you through some of the key strategies that we use. The philosophy of CBT is, is quite ancient and it's based on the idea that the way that we think influences the way that we feel. Uh, one of the famous quotes from Buddha's writing is, we are what we think, all that we are arises with our thoughts, with our thoughts we make our world. And underlying that is the assumption we are meaning-making creatures. We have experiences. Uh, but the same experiences can elicit a whole lot of different emotional reactions depending on our past history and therefore the meaning that we give to that particular uh, experience. And learning to be more aware of some of the thoughts and some of the patterns of thinking that contribute to upsetting emotions in different contexts gives us the ability to, uh, to challenge and sometimes change some of the ways that we think about so when we, when we, in terms of understanding uh, the, the basic model of cognitive behaviour therapy, there are three main components. One is cognitions, and cognitions are thoughts, beliefs, assumptions, the un, often unconscious perceptions that we bring to the situations that we're in. And the way that we think affects the way that we feel, so it largely determines our emotional responses, whether we feel angry or anxious or frustrated sad or resentful or depressed, <coughs> largely influenced by cognitions and the meanings that we give to those situations, also <coughs> affects our behaviour. So for example, if you have a belief that I am defective and people won't like me, the way that you behave in, in, in social relationships is going to be very different to the way that you behave if you believe that I'm okay or I'm a reasonably likeable person. We can, we can demonstrate lots and lots of different cognitions and different beliefs that will influence behaviours. Behaviours matter. Behaviours are the way that we manifest ourselves in the world. Uh, and they have a huge impact on our quality of life, on our relationships, on our ability to achieve our goals and to succeed. And so therefore, um, being aware of cognitions and sometimes modifying cognitions, if we, if we can learn strategies that help change, especially cognitions that are unreasonable and unhelpful, we can actually make a difference not only to their emotional responses in all sorts of contexts, but also to some of the behaviour contexts, some of the behaviour. The interesting thing about this relationship is that it's not one way. They all interact with each other. So when we experience a particular emotion, such as anxiety or anger or sadness, it actually affects the content of our cognitions. So for example, when you are anxious, you are much more likely to perceive threat and to see things in a more catastrophic way than when, you, when your anxiety is low. When you are sad, you are much more likely to perceive things in a uh, pessimistic way and, and see things as, as hopeless. So emotions affect cognitions and emotions affect our behaviours. Behaviours also affect emotions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the behavioural interventions that you can use that can have a direct effect on, on emotions. So uh, when, we, when we're talking about CBT and cognitive strategies, I guess, as I said earlier, um, we immediately think of disputing or challenging our thoughts, recognising our thoughts. And that is one component of CBT. And the classic model that was initially um, developed by Albert Ellis, who was sort of one of the pioneers of CBT, was the ABCD model, and A stands for activating the event, or the actual trigger, the thing that happens. B stands for beliefs, but really what we're talking about here is cognition, so underlying thoughts and beliefs in that situation. C stands for consequences, which includes our emotions and our behaviours, and D stands for dispute, which is that process of challenging. So uh, just a classic example, oh, uh, sorry, and, and one more aspect of it, which, which we actually find quite useful, is teaching people to label their thinking errors. And some of you have probably seen some of these examples of thinking errors, but they include things like black and white thinking, 
seeing things in sort of very tight autonomous ways, mind reading, jumping to conclusions, comparing, awfulizing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are a whole lot of different examples of thinking that is faulty or what we call reasoning errors. So even becoming aware and catching yourself. So you, you, you walk into a place and the receptionist is rude or unpleasant and your immediate thought is she doesn't like me. And then you catch yourself and you sort of think, hang on, I'm doing some mind reading here. You know, she might be having a bad day. This might be her personality. So just becoming more aware that this is just a thought and there's other ways of thinking. Um, so just an example, uh, the activating event is to connect well with a social function, for example, something I guess we all experience at some stage. And we'll go straight to the C, the consequences. And let's say the consequences are you feel a bit anxious, you feel a bit despondent, and uh, behaviours might include uh, withdrawal. And we now actually classify rumination as a cognitive behaviour. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's quite strange. It's something that we do with our mind in response to some sort of event. So rumination is that process of regurgitating and overthinking things that uh, you know, usually respond to some sort of negative experience. Um, and then uh, we, we go to the beads, which are our thoughts and beliefs, and the thoughts may be something like, I look stupid, I'm a loser, they think I'm a misfit. So there may be all sorts of negative thoughts about that situation. And underlying that, there may also be some beliefs such as, I should always connect well in every social situation. We sometimes call this the tyranny of the shoulds. We create rules for ourselves, and when our life circumstances are such that those rules are, are broken in some way, we, we, we get distressed. So this is a common should. Um, I should always connect well in every social situation. Also the assumption that people judge me harshly. And depending on your past experiences, you may have that belief that people, the world is a hostile place, people, People will reject me, people are judging me in a negative way, and that will um, that, that negative belief will also give rise to upsetting emotions. The other common belief is that uh, negative events have permanent consequences. The interesting thing is when we are experiencing a negative event, we often experience high levels of distress, and it feels like whatever we're experiencing, especially when there's intense emotion, it feels like it is true and unchangeable. And one of the things that we forget is setting emotions pass. Life circumstances change all the time. But it tends to feel true at that particular time. Um, so the, the, the next part of the ABC model or cognitive restructuring model is teaching people to dispute it. Dispute is an unfortunate term for it, but it just starts with D, so we use it. Uh, we would like to say reframe. Um, but so we first of all get people to think about what are the reasoning errors and in this particular situation the person might acknowledge that you know they're doing a bit of labeling I'm a loser they're doing a bit of mind reading assuming that they know that other people are making judgments about themselves and just jumping to negative conclusions more generally and then they might come up with some um, uh, statements such as I prefer to connect with but by the way I can see some of you copying these slides I'm happy for, for, for the slides to be shared with people. So it's, it's <laughs> um, I prefer to connect well with people, but it's unrealistic to connect, to expect that in every social situation. It's probably a, a more reasonable, balanced way of saying it. We all like to connect. It's not always going to happen. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, the other thing is most people don't notice and don't care. We, we give far too much attention to ourselves and, and, and have much have excessive expectations about people observing and making judgments, especially if we already have perceptions of our own inadequacy. And uh, most people have been in similar situations in themselves, etc. So you can you can do some disputing, and you may even say, "Look, events like this don't have long-term consequences. I'm feeling a bit flat or upset at the moment, but this is not likely to, to make a long-term difference." However, if it is a situation that occurs really frequently, you may also be asking yourself the question, what can I do about it? What do I need to problem solve? And in situations where people do have more difficulties connecting socially in, in, in social environments, um, there, there, there may be things that we can do in terms of learning, to make eye contact, learning to smile, doing some graded exposure, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, 
were starting with low threat social events and gradually building up the, um, the, the, the degree of um, threat, if you like, and sort of building confidence in all sorts of social environments. So sometimes it's a it's part of an ongoing problem, but sometimes it's just one of those situations that, that is upsetting at the time. So that's all I'm going to say for the moment about behavioural, about cognitive <coughs> strategies, uh, because it is just one component of CBT. And I, um, the longer I've been involved with CBT, the more I, I start to think behavioural strategies can be more powerful. Um, and behavioural strategies involve, and you remember that, uh, I think we've still got that triangle, yeah, that triangle up the top there. Mm. Remember that relationship between cognitions, emotions and behaviours. So you can work by, by directly trying to manipulate cognitions by getting people to identify fault of reasoning errors and challenge their thinking. But you can also start with the behavioural stuff and get people to challenge their cognitions by changing some of their behaviours. And there's different ways of doing that. So uh, we, we're trying to address conscious and sometimes unconscious cognition. Sometimes people will say, the thing about when we're trying to get people to dispute directly using uh, cognitions is that we tend to, sometimes people say, I don't know what I'm thinking. I just feel anxious. You know, it's very hard to, to dispute when you don't know what the cognition is. Um, so behavioral techniques can actually address conscious and unconscious cognition, rational and irrational cognition. And the difference with behavioural disputing is that the learning is experiential. You learn by doing something and you have aha moments because the, uh, the things that you expected to happen didn't happen. Or, or the experience itself opens up the awareness that you may not otherwise have. So let's have a look at some of these. And one of the things that we often encourage people to do is behavioural experiments. And behavioural experiments involves change your behavior, do something that you don't normally do and learn and, and look at the look at the outcome. So for example, with just a few examples of beliefs, if I don't do it perfectly, the consequences will be disastrous. This is for people who um, tend to be very rigid in their thinking and very perfectionistic in their thinking. Uh, you can do all the logical disputing in the world, perfectionists, but you're not going to get a shift until they start to change the so it's the actual, you know, and again, graded exposure, small changes in their behaviour for them to gradually start to recognise that the way that they think is perhaps not reasonable. They start to do things less perfectly. They, you know, you, you, you check your emails once as opposed to 20 times before sending. And you discover that, you know what, it makes no difference. So that, that experiential learning um, in all sorts of situations. If I speak up in, in this room, I'll make a fool of myself. You can dispute it cognitively, but the much more powerful learning is going to be get people to actually do it and learn experientially. If I confront my fear, I'll, I'll be overwhelmed and I won't be able to cope. And again, the, the, the behavioural disputing is much more powerful than the logical stuff here. And in order for the, for the client to have a better chance of success there, we get them to do it in a great way. So you start with small steps. And, and, and take small risks and gradually build up the level of risk. If I don't give in to this craving, it will never go away. Um, and that's, that's a common belief. And you can do that as an experiment. But maybe if you just allow the craving to be there, and in the meantime, you distract yourself by um, some sort of activity, whether it's playing with your pet or going for a walk or whatever it is, maybe you find that after 10 minutes, it does go away or it changes. And if I stop being a complete people please and I'm the right thing, there's a whole lot of beliefs that you can you can test using behavioural experiments uh, taking small steps. Sorry, I'm where I'm talking really quickly, but I'm so really conscious of the potential. So just bear with me, I don't normally talk this fast. Um, other behaviour strategies, so graded exposure uh, is really useful for things like panic attacks. So people that panic attacks they tend to become very avoidant, and we know that people here know that uh, one of the best treatments for, for um, panic is graded exposure, small little steps, getting people to confront their fears. We use it for all sorts of phobias. We use it for social anxiety, getting people to set small goals, small achievable goals and gradually building up their goals. And ex exposure can be in real life, so actually getting people to physically confront some of these situations. It can be in writing and in fact you can actually get quite a lot of 
information uh, by getting people to write about things that are really confronting. And it can be also uh, using imagery. And imagery, um, so we sometimes, uh, for, for example, I have a client I saw recently who's terrified of going into surgery and she has all these sort of catastrophic associations associated with it. So we actually sit there and and, you know, and I talk her through it and it's very distressing, it creates a lot of physical arousal, but we just stay there and I get her to just mindfully accept whatever she's feeling at the time and you start to get a situation, you start to get it wrong. So sometimes one of the things that happens, particularly with anxiety, is that when we are anxious about things, we, we tend to avoid. Anxiety tends to generate a behaviour, and that behaviour is avoidance. And the problem with avoidance is that it tends to feed the anxiety or maintains anxiety. And sometimes we just have to sit with and, and confront some of the things that are disturbing. I had a personal experience of this a few days ago where I accidentally sent an email to somebody which was not meant to go to that person. And you know, when you sort of realise it, and, and I sort of got this sort of hot body reaction when I suddenly thought, oh my God. And it's like you just don't even look at it. And <laughs> I had to make myself go back, open the email, and read exactly what was sent. And it was really difficult. But you know, once I sat with it for about 10 minutes, you start to habituate. You know? Was the email actually about the person you sent it to? It, it included oh, stuff about oh, that person. Oh. <laughs> it, you know, one of these things happened. Uh, sometimes, uh, but, but the, the only way to, to, to sort of deal with that is confront it, sit with it, recognize the reality. And then if there's anything you can do, you do it. If there's not, you actually just work on acceptance. It takes a couple of days and you get over it. <laughs> <laughs> I learned to breathe. But it's exposure. It's exposure. And if I avoided it, it would still be sitting in the back of my mind. Yeah. Um, so um, part of our behavioural strategies is activity scheduling. We know that getting people to schedule activities for themselves is very helpful, particularly when they're depressed or when their mood is very low. And it has both a direct and so again behaviours. So if you go back to that triangle, it's a behaviour which will have a, a direct effect on emotions, but will also have an effect on emotions via cognitions. And so the direct effect on emotions, we know the physical exercise generally helps people to, to feel better emotionally. Any sort of social activity that, that feels comfortable, that's engaging, lift mood, anything that gives people a sense of achievement, and that sometimes may not be an enjoyable task, but people feel good when they've actually achieved that task, um, helps to lift mood and has direct uh, mood impacts and effect, and uh, pleasurable activities, so things that people do that are directly pleasurable, um, whether it's looking at albums, going for photos, um, going for a walk, um, meditating, there's also that indirect effect on emotions via cognition. So people will feel better with certain type of activities because it gives them a sense that they have control over their lives. And that's particularly it, perhaps in the clients that you're seeing, getting them, encouraging them to set goals. If they can achieve those goals and they need to be small and achievable goals, that has a mood enhancing effect because you feel good when you feel that you have some control over your life particularly when there's a whole lot of areas in your life that are beyond your control. Um, and also the other thing about activity scheduling is that it reduces rumination. And we know that rumination is a very key feature of that maintains depression and depressed mood. If we can actually short circuit rumination by getting people to engage in activity, it actually helps to lift mood because it, it uh, cuts out the rumination. Um, and also uh, distraction uh, is useful. And one of the things that we really need to remind people is distressing emotions pass. And so if you can do something, if, if a person can do something to distract themselves during that period of intense emotion, that can be uh, extremely helpful. There's a whole lot of distraction tasks. We, we often encourage people to, to plan the things that are really helpful for them. And it might be having computer games. Actually, computer games are quite good because they, they take up a lot of cognitive space or maybe for any of those things, but they need to work out what, what works for them and sometimes to just engage in those things, particularly when um, distressing emotions are intense. Um, we need to also address some of the physical symptoms. We know that tension, arousal, and a physical, uh, some of the physical symptoms that come with craving are really aversive. They are physiologically very aversive and they trigger strong biological drives for, for seeking relief. 
Um, motivational interviewing, by the way, I think is, is, is terrific and really useful, but people can be extremely motivated and when the craving comes, because the physical um, sensation is so overwhelming, it may still be very difficult to, to, to stick with what you know, they're determined to do. So um, we, I'm sure most people here are aware of all sorts of relaxation techniques that are useful. Uh, and then when people's emotions are hot or their cravings are intense, relaxation will not work. This is, a, this is a technique that needs to be used when they are at a lower level of emotional engagement. Uh, but regular relaxation can help to reduce autonomic arousability. Probably more effective, particularly during that hot stage, is physical exercise. If they're able to physically go out and, and do something that reduces arousal and also helps to look more, probably more important in, in the short term situation. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with mindfulness, so we know that that's, that's really um, provided a, a, a really important extra component that we use in CBT, and I think it's, it's incredibly helpful. And then, um, mindfulness only really became um, used in clinical psychology probably less than 20 years ago, and it's sort of opened up a whole, whole series of different things. And again, it's about uh, all sorts of benefits, including building tolerance to unpleasant emotions and body sensations, observing without judgment. And it's the dropping the resistance. The thing about mindfulness, it's not just about focusing on the present, it's releasing the resistance or the judgment to anything that you're experiencing that is unpleasant. So learning to observe it with an open mind. Uh, when we, when we um, experience distressing um, emotions or physical pain, there's always two components. One is the actual primary thing that we're experiencing, which may be anxiety, depression, or, or, or physical pain. But there's always overriding that, we're sitting on top of that, is that resistance. It's, it's the judgment that this is awful, I can't stand this, I want this to go away. If we can actually remove the secondary part, which is the resistance and the judgment, um, often the primary uh, issue becomes less distressing you actually reduce the intensity of the, uh, of the distress. And using, we, we know that using the breath for attention training and, and self-soothing can be helpful. And, and also mindfulness helps with insight, giving clients more of a sense of where they're at and what's happening to them. So obviously lots of uh, applications for people, for the clients that you're seeing. And um, oh, just very, very briefly, I'm going to talk about process. We, we used to, in CBT, it was always about content of thoughts, changing beliefs, changing thoughts. And now there is, I guess, with the, the third wave of psychological therapies, there's such more attention on process. So we're talking about going from content to process. We're getting people to, isn't it interesting, look at what's going on in my mind right now. That's a process thought as opposed to disputing a particular belief. Um, so observing thought processes, noticing, look, I've been ruminating on this, you know, or I'm catching myself, I'm catching ruminating again. That ability to catch yourself in the act as you are uh, going through repetitive thought processes, as you're worrying, as you're uh, paying attention to things, actually observing your own mind in the process is one of the most valuable um, personal tools, I think, for all of us to actually recognise that you're doing it and then being able to, to move from there. So acknowledge the process as it occurs, understand what the mind is trying to do, and being able to label, ah, if these are just thoughts. This is, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with ACT. Who's, who's familiar with ACT? So yeah. Uh, so, so this is really what ACT is about, what they call de-diffusing. And diffusing is that ability to recognise, oh, I'm having this thought, like, isn't that interesting what my mind is doing? Um, and I think this complements CBT really well. It's just taking a, an additional perspective. But the other thing that um, I think is is really uh, fundamental to resistance to change is uh, metacognitive beliefs. I'm wondering if you've heard of metacognitive beliefs. Okay, some of you have. So metacognitive beliefs are beliefs about our own cognitions, beliefs about our own um, thoughts and emotions. So for example, for example, my anger protects me from them. So we often find there's a real resistance to change. 
And often that resistance is about unconscious beliefs about how we want to be. And in fact, very often, uh, anger is probably the most extreme and, and, and the most uh, salient example. When people are really upset about something, very often they don't want to change the way they feel or they're ambivalent. And sometimes I ask people, how would you like to feel about the situation? And they'll often come back with, I'd like that person to do something. And I, and I say, yeah, but that's what you'd like to happen. But how would you like to feel? And there's this there's, there's ambivalence, you know. Well, part of me thinks this anger is not good for me, but, you know, part of me wants to hold on. And that's true with many upsetting emotions. My worry prepares me for the worst. That is a metacognitive belief that is extremely common, particularly amongst people with generalised anxiety disorder. And in fact, it is, I think, the engine room of generalised anxiety disorder, which is people are very reluctant to release worrying because they believe that it actually has uh, protective benefits. And and with uh, with uh, generalised anxiety disorder in the past, when we used to address, just, just focus on disputing, we got very limited improvements. Now, we're, we're really addressing metacognitive beliefs and getting really significant benefits when people respond and, and improve within, um, sort of, certainly within 10 sessions, a lot of people may not have the criteria to actually targeting the core beliefs that perpetuate them. I need to suffer or make the same mistake again. So when people do something and they screw up and they can't forgive themselves, often, they, you know, and, and you can ask the question, what would happen if you did forget, forgive yourself? Could anything bad happen? Could, could there be any negative consequences if you just do forgive yourself? And often underlying that is an assumption that, you know, I have to learn, you know, I have to suffer because otherwise I won't learn. Or um, if I feel hopeful, I'll, I'll be disappointed. And this is often when you see people with depression they're coming out of depression and they might even have a few good days but they're, they're wanting to focus on the negative because it almost feels unsafe to feel glad and, and, and happy that, uh, that, that things are going well. So identifying and challenging metacognitive beliefs tends to uh, lead to significantly improved um, outcomes and this is where a lot of the focus of CBT is going at the moment. And uh, one of the questions we often ask people, this is when you have people resisting change, people that are reluctant to change. And one of the questions I get people to ask is, does thinking or behaving this way help me to achieve my goals? You know, so someone who's really angry and doesn't want to let go of the anger, I, I'll ask that question, what are your goals here? And, you know, oh, I want to get on with people, I want to be happy, I want to enjoy my job, I want to progress in my career, I want to, you know, be respected as someone who's, you know, who's, who's like or positive. Okay, so does holding on to that anger help you to achieve those goals or is it counterproductive in terms of what you want to achieve? Um, so goal focus thinking, um, there's all sorts of use of imagery, which I'm not going to have time to go into now. So I'm sure many of you, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, some of these online resources. The one I particularly like is Centre for Clinical Intervention (CCI), uh, which I think is excellent and has uh, workbooks for so many different um, uh, topics. And some of you are familiar with My Compass, which is being developed by Black Dog. I think also an excellent uh, resource. Um, so there's lots of good stuff and they're sort of largely based on the CBT model. A lot of it is eclectic. I mean, what we, you know, we sort of call CBT often, you know, I, I remember hearing Aaron Beck, who's the other uh, sort of pioneer of, of cognitive behaviour therapy, he said, if it works, it's CBT, you know. But basically, we're sort of starting to find more and more techniques. We're borrowing from here, we're borrowing from there. We call it CBT, but, uh, you know, it's now hard to sort of separate, to separate the sort of different techniques. It's all about getting people to change thoughts and beliefs and the way they respond to situations. Um, okay, thank you everybody. <laughs>